Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, Natalie. And good morning again, y'all. It is uh, good to be able to share with you this morning uh, and uh, be able to celebrate moms as we gather together today. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about uh, Mother's Day, and I, I don't know if you need a 35-year-old man telling you about mothers. Golly, y'all got to wake up. Okay, it's okay to talk back. Um, I mean, not in a bad way. Don't talk. Don't don't do that. <laughs> don't take that out of context, right? <laughs> it's okay to talk back to me and uh, and speak to me as uh, as we shared a morning this morning. Uh, Preaching is not just a one-way conversation. It's not just uh, me giving to you. I'd love for it to be a, a two-way and for us to have a little bit of conversation as well today as, as much as we can do that. But uh, today is, is Mother's Day, and uh, we're going to celebrate uh, motherhood and, and, uh, and moms and that sort of thing today. Uh, did you know that Mother's Day is a Methodist holiday? Do you know that? In 1908... Uh, a, a lady that was a part of a Methodist church actually started Mother's Day. And she picked up the idea from her own mother who started this thing uh, called the Mother's Friendship Day back in 1868. And then when, her, when, when she passed away in about 1905, um, her daughter who would be Anna Jarvis, uh, picked up this idea of honoring mothers uh, in church. And uh, the first official Mother's Day was in 1908 at St. Andrew's Methodist Church in Grafton, West Virginia. Uh, it is a Methodist holiday. It's kind of neat. It's not just a hallmark way to get you to buy stuff, um, although you can do that. Um, I, I, in fact, if you don't, you know, honor your mom, you're probably going to be in trouble today. Um, so don't forget to call your, your mom. My mom's actually here today. Hey, mom. <laughs> so we're glad that she's here. Uh, my mom's been worshiping with us uh, regularly uh, since she moved up here, and she was watching us online before too, but we're glad to have her closer uh, in Fort Oak. Super excited. Uh, so 113 years after the first Mother's Day is where we find ourselves today. 113 years to the day, actually, uh, would be this celebration of Mother's Day. And so we're going to worship God and thank God for the, the many ways that we are blessed because of mothers, because of women in our lives. And um, we owe a lot to women. We owe a lot to mothers. And I don't think you need me to tell you that again, but I'm going to say it anyhow. We owe a lot. Uh, women have stepped up in so many ways more than they had to, um, way above and beyond the call uh, of duty and, and what is required of them. Uh, they've stepped up and filled in in so many ways, and so we are grateful for the many ways that women and mothers serve and uh, continue to um, be incredible examples to us of love and dedication. So whether you're a biological mother, a, a grandmother, a stepmother, an adopted mother, a foster mother, uh, or an aunt, a grandmother, a sister, a cousin, a friend, uh, all these kinds of ways, we're grateful for all these relationships. Or maybe you're a compassionate youth ministry servant or children's ministry servant, and we're grateful for you in the many ways that you continue to be a mom in this church. And so we want to say thank you. Um, it's the faith of our mothers that we're going to recognize today and speak about and share together with. And it's this faith that we're grateful for, both in the spiritual faith and also in the dedication side of faith. The word mama, did you know that the word mama appears in, in some kind of form in about 12 or more languages? The idea of the, the M sound shows up in a lot of languages, um, in, in more than a dozen different languages. And it's sort of thought that, you know, as, as you've raised a child, you probably remember this as they start to vocalize, right? That M sound is one of those ones that kind of shows up to start with. And so it's sort of thought that this idea is sort of a, a primal, basic longing for connection. And as it comes out, and that might be where we got the word mama from. In Hebrew, it is actually ima. And again, you can kind of hear that M sound that shows up there, ima. Um, and, uh, you know, a similar word to what we have in English. And then Spanish would be madre, as we have um, uh, some Spanish speakers with us today. So that word is a, an important word for us. Um, it's a connection. It's a relationship. It means a lot more than just a name, right? And I've heard moms say, you know, I'm going to change my name. 
<laughs> you know, because kids call it a lot, right? If they want something, they're going to call, they're going to call mama most of the time. So we're going to talk about the, the, our, our holy mother, which would be Mary, um, and we're going to go to that example in the Bible. And you heard a little bit of that scripture uh, read here just a minute ago. Um, we're going to go to the Gospel of John and look at the two times that Mary is talked about uh, specifically and kind of talk about her as an example of what it means to be a mom. If you remember, though, the Gospel of John starts with this gigantic, like, Lord of the Rings, Marvel comic kind of epic introduction, right? you got this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And it's just this really amazing sort of epilogue introduction to the Gospel of John. What we don't have in the Gospel of John would be like the birth narratives that you're used to, the Christmas narratives, you know, the ones that we read around Christmas time. There's no magi, there's no shepherds, there's no genealogy, there's none of that in the Gospel of John. Um, in fact, we get this grand epic in the beginning kind of thing, and then John sort of shifts to talking about John the Baptist and, and his uh, upbringing and sort of his beginning of his ministry and paving the way for Jesus. And then the story shifts to talking about Jesus, calling his first disciples, and then what's normally called the first miracle. So we find ourselves in Cana of Galilee, uh, gathered with the disciples at a wedding feast. Uh, Jesus is there, his mom's there, the disciples are there. We don't really know whose wedding this is or, or you know, if it's a family member or someone in the town or what or why, those circumstances. But we do know that there's a problem. And it is kind of a cool thing and I think a purposeful thing that who notices that there's a problem? Do you know the problem? So there's, there's a wedding feast, right? And you're supposed to take care of your guests. We've either done that or been a part of that, probably most of us. And uh, it, it is a party foul to run out of food, right? It's a bad thing if you run out of food or if you run out of drink. And for the Jews to run out of wine would have been a really, really big deal. But Mary notices. Mary notices that there's a problem. And she actually, she's the first one to notice that we get a count of. And, and what does she do? <laughs> She actually does something really interesting. She goes and she finds some servants, and she also talks to Jesus a little bit, her son, but she finds the servants and she says, you know, do whatever he tells you to do. Whatever it is that he's about to require of you, do it. And I can imagine, I'm sort of reading into this a little bit, but, but I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say that for her to find a servant and say to the servant, hey, do whatever he tells you to do, sort of implies that she's going to take care of the finances for this too, by the way, I think. There's a little bit of that sort of understood, right? You don't tell somebody to take care of it or that he's going to take care of it without an understanding that it's going to be paid for, right? It's not going to be on the, on the uh, bridal party. Of course, there's no cost involved because he turns water into wine, right? Um, but they didn't know that. They didn't know what was about to happen. So she notices that, prepares the servants, then goes to Jesus and says, hey, we're out of wine. This is a problem. Jesus does what any good son would do. He says, why does that matter to me? Like, <laughs> what am I supposed to do about that, right? Um, and Mary goes, you know, again, kind of reading into a little bit, you can imagine, she, she sort of pushes him a little bit more and goes like, hey, take care of this. You can take care of this. Don't let this be an embarrassment or don't let this be a problem. And so Jesus proceeds. He doesn't argue anymore with his mom and he takes care of it, right? He turns water into wine. A incredible miracle, an incredible first miracle. But it's his mom that does this. It's his mom that sort of sets this up and gets this ready, and she is the one who notices what's going on there. How many, times have our, how many times have our moms in our lives, or how many times have you as a mom noticed that there was a problem and you took care of it without anybody really realizing that you're the one that took care of it, right? Sort of the silent behind the scenes, taking care of stuff, making sure it's all good. And that's what Mary does here. That's what Mary does in this example. You know that uh, birds spend months watching their parents learning how to fly before they actually fly. They, they observe, they sort of study, they, they, they wonder what this is like, but they have no idea what it's like out beyond that nest. Um, and if you want to watch something really interesting, later Google or go on YouTube and look up how eagles learn how to fly. It's kind of a neat thing to watch. And, and so they do, they sort of observe and watch their parents for a while and then they, they sort of get this kind of push from one of their parents and they start sort of hopping from branch to branch until they maybe catch a wind and sort of figure it out from there. 
And this is a little bit what's going on here with Jesus is Mary sets this up for him. She's been teaching him his entire life. She has been showing him what to do and why this is important and these sort of things. And she gently nudges him just like a mama bird would nudge her, her young bird to fly, to get out beyond the nest. It's your time. It's, it's time to go. It's time to launch. It's time to, to get out of the nest a little bit and, and stretch your wings. And that's what she does. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry that this happens, and really the beginning of his public ministry, right, as the first miracle, the first public miracle that happens. What's really, really interesting in the Gospel of John is that the next time that we hear from Mary, specifically, she's there through it all, we know that from other Gospels, but the next time we hear from Mary in the Gospel of John is at the very end, and we read that scripture here this morning. It's at the very end, it's when Jesus is being crucified and literally in agony and in pain and suffering that Mary shows up again and we get some very specific instructions from Jesus. And what we know from John is that here are the people that are gathered at the foot of the cross. It's, it's Mary, Jesus' mother, it's Mary's sister. We have Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and John all gathered at the foot of the cross. Everybody else really has either left because of fear or they've turned their back or they have uh, denied Jesus in the case of Peter, but these are the ones that are gathered here, and it's Mary, again, in in this text. I want to read John 19, verse 26 and 27 again, and from Jesus seeing this, it says, Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, and he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her in his own home. Of course, Jesus is crucified, and he can't really move a whole lot in that that situation that's going on. But you can kind of imagine like him gesturing maybe with his head or sort of looking in that direction to make it really clear who he's talking about and what he means by what he's saying. But it's Mary. It's his mom who's faithful to the end with a handful of others. So even as this little bird left the nest to soar, like, a, like a, an adult bird, Mary continued to keep a watchful eye in Jesus' life, in Jesus' ministry. She's there. She's, she's there through it all, and she did so much more behind the scenes, probably without Jesus even knowing it was her or realizing that she did it or, or without seeking to get the credit from it. She remained. She's faithful through it all. When so many disciples were scared or turned their back or betrayed or, or uh, denied Jesus, Mary and a handful of others journeyed with Jesus, even to the cross, even to the cross. And so she's kind of an example of a devoted, faithful, encouraging mother for us all. So I want to shine that spotlight on her. She allowed her son to lead, but she continued to find little ways to serve, little ways to be involved, and little ways to continue to be a disciple through it all. While John only includes these two references to Mary, I want to kind of reference the other ones in Matthew and Mark and Luke. So let's look at those a little bit as well. In Matthew, we learn of Mary's miraculous conception as she is going to give birth and she's not even married. Her role, we learn of her role in the flight to Egypt and we learn of the family's return back to Nazareth and her setting up the household there. In Mark, as Jesus' fame begins to grow, we get Mary's name named for the first time. Not just the mother of Jesus, but Mary. Very important thing that she is named there by name. But it's in Luke's account, Luke's account of the gospel, uh, Luke's gospel account of Jesus, where we get the most descriptions about Mary. And again, it all happens kind of at the beginning as Jesus is getting started. And we learn a lot about Mary's character or, or about Mary's integrity and who she is. We get this beautiful sort of poetic hymn, song kind of thing called the Magnificat which that's the Latin word for the first word that she uses there. My soul magnifies the Lord, she says, and I rejoice in God, my Savior. My spirit rejoices in God. This we learn of who Mary is and what she's like as she agrees to follow God's plan. In Luke as well, we, we learn of, of Jesus' disappearance in the temple. And we learn of Mary's motherly response to her son and correction as she gets onto him and chastises him for getting lost and playing in the temple without her permission. Right? That's really what's going on there. Okay? He sort of, you know, shows her a different way and helps her understand that there's something else going on. But from a mom's perspective, she's worried because she just lost the son of God. <laughs> it's, it's funny because it's true, right? This is, this is human. This is what she's going through. Um, 
as they search. And then finally in, in Acts, Luke actually wrote Acts as well. Hopefully you know that. In Acts, we learn that Mary is involved as a disciple beyond Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. She's actually gathered in the upper room with the disciples as one of the disciples awaiting the Holy Spirit to come in the beginning of Acts. Mary continues as a disciple even after her son is gone. What a, what a great example of, of what it means to be a mom. I, and again, I don't think you need me to tell you that there are a lot of pressures on moms today. There's a lot of pressure on what it means to be a mom. Pressures from society or culture, expectations, and probably the worst source of pressure, the worst sort of anxiety that comes is probably as a result of other moms putting that pressure on other moms. There's a lot of weight that comes, that's put on the success of raising kids or being the best mom and, and much more than what it's supposed to be, which kind of moms want to rise to that occasion and be the best they can and that kind of thing, but there's so much pressure there. So let me say like two really important things, and the first would be, dads, you're just as much on the hook as moms are. Not going to release that. That's, that's a very real thing. God designed the family on purpose for that reason, it takes, it takes a family to raise a child. Very important thing. So dads, at least step up, take half if not more. I'm not going to release you from that. I believe you should do that and take that place. Find a way to be a dad in the midst of that. Co-parent, co-partner in the midst of it all. God designed it and God would bless it that way. The second thing is, is on behalf of the church or me personally, I just want to say I see you. I see the pressure that's going on there and, and realize that. And I can't feel it the way you feel it, obviously, but, but it's real. I see it. Your church sees you and, and knows what you're going through as well and feels that pressure of being a mom. And it's a real kind of pressure. Your desire to get it right and raise good kids is very important, very noble, and I realize that it is a lot of pressure. Trying desperately to hold it together in, in difficult, often difficult situations like, like divorce or broken families or absent fathers or single parenthood, overworked husbands, all kinds of hosts of other issues, maybe even death of a spouse. There are all kinds of things that make this harder than it should be and the pressure is very real. Beyond just realizing it, let me offer you some encouragement today as well. It's important to name it. It's important to realize that it's real and that it's present, but maybe there's a little bit of hope to be found. I hope, I hope there is in this. And a little bit of encouragement is for you to realize that, you know, we need to stop comparing ourselves to the, the highlights of other people's lives, right? You've probably heard it said similarly to that before, is that, what people put on Facebook or Instagram is really like the highlights usually of what happened, right? They scrolled through their feed and found the best photo to be able to post it, that kind of thing. And what you need to realize from that mom that you're looking at, it looks like she has an ideal life, right, with the happy smiling kids, is that she threatened her kids to get that picture, right? And then she got thrown up on right after the picture was taken. That's, that's real life, right? That's, that's real in the midst of what's going on and what it's really like in that. So, if you don't know this, know that comparison steals joy. Comparison steals joy. So stop comparing yourselves to other people and especially comparing yourselves to the highlights reels of their lives because that's not a fair comparison, first of all, and it's not who God's wanting you to be, right? Be the only mom that you can be, moms. And I would say kids, too, as we get better at this is realizing that our moms are the only moms they can be. It's a hard lesson to realize and learn and continue to remember is that instead of forcing other people to be who we want them to be is let them be who God has designed them to be. Give each other some breathing space there. Let me make it a little bit more real and I kind of put the spotlight on Mary today and, and, and we've honored her a little bit as an example of what it means to be a faithful mom. But let me also remind you of who Mary is. And don't forget this, that Mary was a teenage, unwed, virgin girl from a poor family in a small town. Does that make her human today? I hope it does. While she ultimately followed God and, and followed God's plan for her life and accepted that calling to carry the Savior, also remember that Mary was so scared when the angel first appeared to her that, that she, was, she trembled in fear. The text shows that, and the angel has to comfort her, right? 
every time angel shows up, it sort of freaks people out. They're not the happy little cherub things in the sky, right? They're pretty terrifying. Um, so she's scared. She's scared. And not only that, that when she gets the news and when she understands what's about to happen, she runs away. She runs away and stays with her cousin Elizabeth for a couple of months. And you could say maybe she was either terrified or, or afraid or didn't know what to do or was ashamed or, or trying to figure out, like, how in the world do I tell my husband or my about-to-be husband, we're not even married yet, how do I tell him what's about to happen? And oh, by the way, when she tells him, it's not like she can hide it because she's already showing at that point, right? A couple of months in, three, four months in, the text says. So don't forget that that's who she is and what she's going through. She's a great example of what it means to be a mom, and I think she's a really real example of what it means, what, what, what motherhood means for us as we look at that. A very real way that only Mary could be. She was the best mom for Jesus. She was the mom that God had called her to be. And it's true for, for you all too as, as moms, as ladies, as, as God's chosen you to be that mom that only you can be. It's true for us as well as kids, don't forget. Way beyond the physical, way beyond the biological, let me me offer one other really important thing for us to, to realize. Jesus gives a command there from the cross to his mom and to this disciple. And he and he says, Mom, or he says, Woman, actually, behold your son, and to the disciple, behold your mom. He changes what it means to be a mother and a son. He really radically changes what the family looks like and what the family means. This is the reason why, as followers of Christ, we can call each other brothers and sisters, right? Because God has given us a new relationship. We we are friends, yes, but we are also brothers and sisters in Christ. And let me take it another step, since we're talking about mothers, is that we also have a lot of spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers in our lives as well. And so it's totally appropriate for, for me to refer to another lady as, as mom, as mom in the faith or as a father in the faith, right? And we can do that with each other because we've been there. We've, we've given examples of what that looks like in our lives. And it's an important thing to realize that. Jesus radically redefines what it means to be the family and what the family looks like. And so let me leave you with this. If it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a church to raise a disciple. Okay, let me say it again. If it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a church to raise a disciple. And so I want to encourage you and, and inspire you and maybe kick you in the butt a little bit and say, get involved in the, in the raising, the spiritual raising of kids in this church, right? As, as people come to this church and, and, and trust us with their kids, that's not just some place down the hall that we send our kids. Those are real adults. Those are real people who love on these kids and, and give of themselves to help raise kids that are not even theirs, in a, in a, not in a physical sense, and they sort of adopt them spiritually. And so I want to encourage you to be the spiritual mom and the spiritual dad that God has called you to be. So find ways to help raise the kids in this church and in the community that they would become followers of Jesus as well. That they would continue to follow Jesus and and begin to follow Jesus because the example that they see inside of you. So while we say Happy Mother's Day today to to our biological moms, our physical moms, I also want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the spiritual moms in my life and, and the spiritual moms in the life of this church. God has called you to do those things, and we're grateful for that. And grateful in the ways in which you serve and the ways in which God is calling you to continue to be a mom. As that faith of the mothers, faith of our mothers, would continue to inspire, continue to grow, continue to rear up new disciples of Jesus in this place. Thank you, and happy Mother's Day. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for all that you do and for all of who you are. Continue to guide us, God, as we would be faithful and grateful to all the many ways in which you bless us through, through women, through ladies, through, through mothers, both physically and spiritually in our lives. God, help us to be more fully the family of God as we would live into that relationship and, and that new way of being and living, help us to, to realize that you've called us together, 
across all kinds of things that may would separate us, to be one family, one family of God. And we thank you. Continue to unite us together for that common mission that more people would know Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. 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 Will you guys stand and join us as we sing our last?